Nieras. I am currently a bioinformatics training and outreach coordinator with a, an organization called HTA Bionet. It's a non-profit organization. And I'm currently based at the University of Cape Town. Um, but in parallel to that, I do also, well, I am also registered as a PhD student at the University of the Western Cape, um, where I wear a slightly different hat. Um, with HJ Bionet, I do a lot of bioinformatics training, but with my PhD, I'm actually doing a lot of marine biology, genetics, and taxonomy. Um, so two slightly different hats. Um, but they've they've kind of started to become very interrelated um, over the last few years, which has been quite exciting for me. Sure, sure. So um, for me, I kind of bounced around primary schools um, quite quite a lot. I went to four different primary schools, um, but I went to two schools on the Cape Flats, so I was always in Cape Town. I also did my high schooling year um, right in Cape Town, so I never left Cape Town. Um, and once I matriculated, I moved to the University of the Western Cape where I did my undergrad. Um, and my undergrad was very interdisciplinary. So I did an undergraduate um, degree in conservation biology actually. Um, and just via that degree and everything that was required for my then mini thesis, I started to do a lot of you know, genetics, graphical information systems, a lot of biostatistics. Um, and so that's why I kind of think of myself as a little bit of a jack of all trades. <laughs> but a master of none yet. Um, but I think of myself as a bit of a jack of all trades um, when it comes to science, but that's just owing to just, you know, my educational background, my formal training, um, and also informal training, I guess, with, with volunteer, you know, groups that I've worked with and so on. Um, I think it's all contributed to, to, you know, what I've become as a scientist um, and as a trainer, especially as well. Um, but very standard, very standard schooling. Um, I did my schooling in the standard amount of time, nothing special. Um, I wouldn't say I was even a special student, to be fairly honest. I was fairly average, if I can be be blunt, um, definitely not at the top of the crop, very much right in the middle, um, very mediocre in many ways as well. But I think that, um, yeah, I've grown over, over the years, of course. So for me, it was a very, very early decision. Um, I think when I tell people this, they, they kind of think I'm, I'm not being too truthful, but I kind of decided that I wanted to be a marine biologist when I was about nine years old. Um, and I remember it very specifically because it was just in a, like an epiphany. I just kind of went, you know, this is what I want to do. This is what I enjoy. This is what I love. I love animals. I love nature. And more than anything, I love the ocean. Um, and I think that love was sort of also um, fostered by the fact that my dad, you know, was at the beach all the time. He took us to the beach all the time. He loved fishing. <laughs> he loved crayfishing. Um, and so he would always take us along with him. And I think it's just that sort of natural love that started to grow for nature. Um, and from very early on, I spent a lot more time outdoors than I did indoors. Um, yeah, I was always that, that girl playing in the trees or playing in the sand outside or <laughs> scratching around, you know, picking up bugs. And I guess that from that age, I think everybody kind of knew that I was going to be, you know, I, I would go into science in some way. Um, if it wasn't, you know, hardcore sciences, it would probably be teaching. So um, I think if I wasn't a scientist, I'd be a science teacher, to be fairly honest. Um, but I think science was always kind of end game for me from a very early age. Yeah, so for me, undergraduate, my undergraduate experience was pretty rough. Um, I think I wasn't 100% sure of what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do science. I knew I wanted to do biology. But beyond that, I didn't really know too much. Um, my goal was always to do marine biology, but I was very open to, you know, wherever life kind of led. Um, but marine biology was always what I really wanted to do. And so I always kind of structured, I kind of structured my undergraduate courses around that. Um, being in biodiversity and conservation biology, to be fairly honest, it was so interdisciplinary though that I didn't really have to take courses from many other faculties um, with my undergraduate you know, degree, just because I did biodiversity and conservation biology, we were all primed to do a lot of different things. So it was compulsory for me to do a bit of statistics. It was compulsory for me to do a bit of um, chemistry, biochemistry. It was compulsory to do, you know, plant physiology, animal physiology, zoology, biodiversity, um, more, more, more broadly, ecology. Um, and they, the, all of those different sort of fields were sort of mashed up into one sort of big degree. So for me, um, I 
kind of like that because I sort of started to see, you know, what kind of topics or domains I gravitated towards more. And for me, it kind of always was more, you know, numbers and data. Um, ironically, I was really bad at math during my undergrad. I had probably the lowest scores, but I really enjoyed it. It's just that the way that it was applied at the time didn't resonate with me. Um, but when I moved to honors, I went from almost failing math to getting, you know, A's in biostatistics, which I kind of shocked me as well. But it was because I was applying it in a way that, um, you know, just resonated with me and the way my mind works. Um, so that was very interesting to me, how much I hated math in undergrad and how much I like numbers now is very, very interesting to be fairly honest. Uh, but it's kind of taken me by surprise as well. To be fairly honest, it had kind of the opposite effect. Um, what happened was I started to become interested in everything. Um, and that's why at the beginning I said kind of like a jack of all trades and a master of none because I really do like everything. And I think that is a, a blessing and a curse for the type of you know formal training that I had was just that I was exposed to so much. And so I was familiar with so much and then I became interested in so much. So. You know, it was actually very difficult for me navigating from that point, because even when I went from my honors to my master's and from my master's to my PhD, um, there was so much that I wanted to do. And I think that sometimes holds me back a little bit. It's just, I want to do so much and I want to learn so much and I want to apply so much, but really you can't do everything all of the time. Um, and so it, it actually had a, the opposite effect that, you know, I liked everything, but silver lining was that I also then was able to integrate in many different environments um, because I had, you know, a bit of knowledge of everything and I was also open to anything. It meant that I had a very weird career path. You know, I was literally open to accepting any, any type of position. If I was going to be a window washer, I would have been a window washer. I would have just been the best window washer there was. And that's just kind of how I approach things. So my career, rather than me directing it, for me personally, it kind of grew organically from just experience to experience, you know, just being open to positions. It kind of just led from one thing to the other for me. So for me, my career has been very organic. It, it's been much less directed um, than I think a lot of people think. It was difficult at first. Um, I think it was difficult in the sense that in a way I had a lot more freedom um, about my time, about you know the types of courses that I took. Um, where I also dedicated time, I had a lot of autonomy with that. And I also, you know, could for the first time choose what I wanted to do a little mini thesis on with my honors, which then obviously grew to a full thesis with my masters. But I was very much in the direct seat for that. And that for me was very different because in undergrad, you're kind of just trained to follow the rules, you know. Um, you need to tick boxes. <laughs> you have to submit X amount of essays that follow X format. Um, but with postgrad, I, our postgraduate um, sort of was organized in such a way that a lot of it was on you, which was very autonomous. If you didn't want to do something, you didn't do it and you missed out and they moved on. Um, undergrad very much was like that too, but with honors, it was just, it was very different and you were very much tested into the real world. Um, because we were there, you know, all day, every day I was there on the weekend. <laughs> I had my first exposure to proper, proper lab work. Um, I had been doing lab work throughout undergrad, but that was my first time fully on my own. I was designing my first experiments, you know, optimizing studies and protocols. And it was my first experience really taking ownership of that. And I think that was scary, but in a weird way, it, it's actually what made me realize that science was where I was happiest and what I wanted to do because I also came into my own, um, so I'm, I don't do well in boxes and I realized that with my undergrad, to be honest, I think academically I was the weakest student coming into my postgraduate studies from the whole cohort, I was at the bottom. Um, and by the end of it, I was one of the top students. And so I always like to tell people that because it doesn't matter where you start. Um, it just it, it matters what, what you do, you know, once you get started. Um, and I very much live by those principles. And I did that in honors, you know, I gave myself a fresh start. I said, you know, you sucked in honors, you did so poorly. You suffered, you know, you had a lot of mental, you know, issues and it was just hard on you, but have honors be a clean slate. And, you know, my professors at the time, you know, I, I did know a lot of them in undergrad, but I saw them in postgrad as well. And they kind of did the clean slate thing with me. You know, they forgot about how poorly I performed in undergrad. And because of that, just that clean slate was really amazing for me because then, you know, I cum laude my honors 
coming from, you know, almost failing undergrad. So, you know, that doesn't happen very often. And it just showed me that once I, I do things that I want to do and I apply it in the way that I want to apply it and the way that resonates with me, the way I understand it, I'm not actually as dumb as I thought. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So um, a lot of my my own research, my my own personal research for my for my studies, um, has predominantly been in marine biology, like I've mentioned. Um, so I think from honors, my masters, now with my PhD, it's been very much rooted in marine biology, um, but also very much in taxonomy. So I look at naming and describing species. Um, and now with my PhD, I'm, I'm sort of going um, and looking at species connectivity in terms of the genetics along the West African coast, hopefully also the East African coast eventually. Um, but we're looking at species connectivity, we're looking at a lot of the population biology, the ecology, um, and also trying to draw bigger, you know, sort of pictures and, and conclusions from that in terms of, you know, evolution of these metazoan species. Um, and what's been interesting for me now is now that I'm working in bioinformatics, I've actually started to um, sort of, you know, incorporate bioinformatics into my work as well. And so now I've, I've started um, a whole genome sequencing project where hopefully, you know, I hope to contribute to our sort of understanding of metazoan evolution. Um, because jellyfish are so understudied, you know, there aren't many genomes and the more genomes that are published, we're starting to see very interesting things in the genomes. Um, things that haven't been seen in, in the genomes of any other organism. Um, and so I think that holds a lot of potential as well. We see them um, having a lot of potential for biomedical applications. Um, we actually have groups now studying jellyfish for specifically, you know, pharmaceutical applications or biotechnology, biotechnological applications. Um, so, you know, using them to turn them into products, they're being turned into protein shakes, they're being turned into food. Um, they're being farmed in, in a lot more places in the world now. Um, and when I started studying jellyfish, that wasn't really the norm, really. That was about 10 years ago. Um, that wasn't really the norm. You know, nobody really worried with jellyfish. It was a few of us doing it. And it's, it's already grown and exploded um, over the last decade alone. So that's that's been interesting for me to see, you know, going from, you know, 50 people over here doing jellyfish to like 500. That, that's been nice to see just the natural progression. Um, as we learn more about, you know, species diversity on the planet as well. It's nice to see how people's focuses are kind of shifting um, from, you know, the, obviously the big sort of keystone taxa to the not so keystone, smaller things that you didn't know mattered so much. So that, that's that been quite nice for me to see. So for me, um, one of the very, very interesting things that I found out is that very really recently we did um, sort of a global study on you know all of the eastern boundary current jellyfish along the world and what we found was that nearly all of them had a very similar pattern of evolution and i thought that was really interesting and the pattern of evolution kind of mimicked um you know the big me meteorological strike that happened i think it's in the gulf of mexico you know that formed the gulf of mexico and it kind of you know a lot of the evolution centered around that you know when that happened the oceans changed um and we actually see that mimicked in jellyfish speciation. So we saw, you know, an increase in the number of species that were out there. We saw them all follow similar patterns of, of divergence of speciation. But what was interesting was that although many follow that same pattern, not all of them do, um, even if they were in existence back then when, you know, all of this happened and, and they kind of originated around the same time, not all of them still follow, follow the same pattern, which is very interesting. Some of them, you know, it's it's basically one species across the world. For other genera, it's multiple species in different places. Um, sometimes there are multiple species in, in one location. And, and that was something but that was interesting because we didn't expect that with jellyfish, that there would be so much diversity. And one of the, the other very interesting things we found is that there's a lot more diversity than we thought. There's a lot of crypses. Um, so when you look at the genetics, for example, what looks like one species can be 12. Um, uh, there's a classic case of this um, genus called Aurelia. Aurelia was traditionally thought to be one species all across the world, almost. Um, and a scientist came along and started to look at them in more, in more detail. And with one study, I think they were split into nine. It's now grown to to, you know, six, I think about 12 to 16 known species, and it just keeps on growing. And that's because of the genetics that, are, that has been, you know, incorporated now. But then we see a lot of morphological plasticity where they either look the same everywhere or different everywhere. 
Um, so that's been very interesting and, and we are starting to see that it actually mimics a lot of um, the environments that they are in. And we're trying to now sort of start to build more elaborative models where we can actually prove that and say, you know, it is because the temperature here is X, Y, Z versus here that is actually causing them to speciate. Because the boundaries within the ocean is obviously not as simple as uh, on land. Um, you know, the, the ocean is kind of homogenous um, on the surface, but very heterogeneous below the surface. Um, and then, you know, modeling species, you know, boundaries and things like that become very complicated. But that's what's been interesting is, you know, how little we know with what, with how much we still know. Um, so that's been really quite interesting over the last few years. So my PhD is looking at both species identities um, along the West African coastline, but also species connectivity. I'm also trying to look at species boundaries. Um, so seeing what level of mismatch do we have in terms of our own understanding at the moment. Um, so we know that, you know, a series of species occur in, you know, X, Y, Z place. Um, and traditionally, we always thought that, you know, you only get one species per large marine ecosystem. So my study is kind of investigating whether that's true. It's probably not true, um, but we're trying to look at the level of mismatch between how many species we actually identify. Um, versus how many we expected to see there um, for that large marine ecosystem, because it's going to tell us a lot about ecosystem, you know, dynamics. It's going to tell us a lot about the population biology of the jellyfish. Um, we're going to learn a lot about speciation and and possibly be able to tie that to broader models, hopefully. Um, but then the other portion of, of my study is also just looking at some of the population biology in detail of a couple of key species, um, and then also trying to build the reference genome um, for one of the jellyfish that, that we're looking at. And so I want to build the reference genome, not only to have the reference genome, but also so that we have more genomes available when we do do any type of mapping in the future. Um, but also with the hope that whatever pipeline I, I come up with um, as part of, you know, sort of assembling and annotating that genome can then be made open source so that other people can use it particularly people working with non-model organisms, marine organisms and gelatinous um, zooplankton in general. So I'm hoping that, that, you know, by doing a lot of this, I'm also putting a lot of information about how to do this out there. Um, a lot of, you know, jellyfish biologists, taxonomists, we all kind of traditionally have worked in a lot of silos. And so what we do only is known to us. <laughs> so I'm also hoping that um, with my project, I'm going to make a lot of things open source a lot of my methods and stuff like that. So I'm just hoping that by doing that also, it helps a lot of other groups see that, you know, maybe they, they need less than they thought to actually do this kind of work. Um, Cause we've been able to do it on, on a very low budget at the moment. And we've done a lot with the little that we've gotten. So I think it's, it's useful to share um, a lot of those experiences as well as the insights that we've been able to manage to get with, you know, that, that those limited resources. Yeah, no, so I'm going to say I didn't manage it well. Um, I think I'm managing a little bit better now than I did back then, but definitely with my undergrad, my honors, a lot of my masters, um, because I was kind of studying and working um, at the same time, a lot of the time, I think my mental health just naturally suffered. Um, I don't think that anything I could have done would have probably prevented that because I was just exhausted all the time and I was just taxed mentally. Um, and I think that if I had gone back, I would have probably done things exactly the same way, which is sad to say, but it's, it's the honest truth. I would have still overworked myself. I would have still done more than I probably should um, in order to get to where I was now. But I think for me at the moment, where I've managed to get, you know, based on that sacrifice, the sacrifice kind of seems worth it. But I do see how I could have managed things a lot better back then. Um, I was depressed a lot of the time. I still get depressed often now. I think every scientist can attest to getting depressed quite quite a lot actually in our careers. And it's, it's for a lot of us, it's almost unavoidable because of the amount of pressure that we just naturally have on us. And not to say that other careers don't have the same level of pressure, they very much do. Um, but that's the point, right? We're all under so much pressure all of the time. And I think goalposts keep changing, especially in science. Um, you know, at first, you know, when you did a master's, you were very sought after. Now everyone has a master's. Now you have to do a PhD. And now that everyone's getting PhDs, now you have to do a postdoc. And <laughs> now you've already seen jobs asking for four to five postdocs before they'll hire you. So I think that is very difficult and mentally taxing. 
Um, but I think that we all kind of learn to deal with things in our own way. For me, what really helps is taking time out. Um, although that's the one thing I, I, I barely do um, because I just don't have that time to spare all the time. But one one key thing is just take time out because um, time out really it not just calms you down and eases your mind, but it gives you a lot of perspective. Um, and a lot of the time I find that when I do take some time out, the task that I've been battling with for two weeks takes me two hours to complete. And I think that's unanimous for, for a lot of scientists and for a lot of people in our tissue environments. Um, but for me, the key thing has just been take a break. And also, I obviously like to go swimming. Um, so just going to the beach or just being, you know, taking a walk on the beach, that, that kind of calms me down and eases my mind a lot. And it has always done that. Um, so, yeah, so I, I will be the first one to say I probably don't manage my stress and my mental health as well as I should. Um, but I think that now that I'm getting older, I'm realizing how important it was to maybe have, you know, managed and dealt with it better when I was younger so that by now I'm, I've, I've got my mechanisms in place, you know, when I do feel down and out or I'm, I'm too mentally taxed. And I'm only now starting to find some of those methods that help me. So I'm, I think I'm a bit behind um, where a lot of other people are at my age, but I, I think to each his own, you know, everybody's got their own journey. But I'm also a big believer in seeking help. Um, so if you feel like you can't manage, it's because you probably cannot manage. And there's no shame in that and there's no harm in admitting that either. Um, and so I feel like if you are feeling overwhelmed or mentally taxed, there's absolutely no problem with going and seeking medical attention because sometimes that is the only thing that helps. And I think it's important for us to not stigmatize that, but to also accept that sometimes we need a bit more help than we can give ourselves. It's, it's a tough pill to swallow, but... It's, it's a pull we must swallow, I think, if we do struggle with our mental health. I think I've, I've been very fortunate, I must say, um, within my time in academia to be exposed to, you know, a lot, of, a lot of African scientists and a lot of brilliant African scientists. And that made me feel more pressurized, right? Because I was like, oh, my word, there's so many, there's so much brilliance, like across the continent. Like, how do you stand out and... How do you persist in, you know, such such an environment with so much brilliance? Um, and that 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 to me was very difficult to grapple with because I always kind of felt like no matter what I did, I was not going to be as amazing as these people. Um, and a lot of these people have done more amazing things with less, you know, less resources than I had. And, and how do you compete with that? But I very quickly realized that I was looking at it like it was a competition and it's not. Um, I think everybody's starting point is very different. Everybody's opportunities throughout life is very different. And so what you accomplish is very different, but relative to your starting point, a lot of us accomplish big things, right? What might be big for you might not be big for me, but it's really big for you based on your starting point. And so I think when I started to look at life through that lens, I started to go, ah, but you know, maybe I've not done that bad and actually I've done that well considering where I started. And so did the other person next to me. Um, and so when I started to view things like that, it, it kind of started to lift pressure. And I also started to change the way I looked at my own skills because um, I must say when I entered Bionet, I felt very underskilled. Um, there were all these big, you know, data scientists and programs from computer science backgrounds and, and I was not that. And so that was very difficult for me to find a way to fit in. But I just realized that, you know what, hey, <laughs> everyone has their own strengths. Everyone has their own weaknesses. What I'm really strong in, a lot of programmers and coders are not. And what I'm not strong in, they are strong in. And if I look at it in the sense that they can complement me rather than compete with me, we can build something that's a lot bigger than all of us. Um, and so I've kind of just approached a lot of the things I've done at Bionet with that perspective. So if I couldn't do something, I didn't feel like a failure or felt less, I went, who can do it? And will they contribute to the project? And even if my contribution is finding other contributors, then it's, it's a worthy contribution. Um, and I think just reframing life like that, it, it starts to, it stops being a race and it stops being a competition and it starts being a partnership. Um, and so that's what I've been focusing on is growing partnerships and not looking at any situation as me competing with somebody rather than you know, us growing together and making each other better and being able to learn from each other. And once I started doing that, I just saw my development shoot through the roof um, overall across the board, both personal, emotional, and also um, in terms of my academia. 
Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, post-grad was very much unfamiliar territory. I, I also didn't have anyone to chat about it, um, to just ask the experiences. So that for me was very difficult. And I think the way that I navigated it was just one day at a time. I, I always just told myself just one day at a time, one class at a time, one assignment at a time. And to not get overwhelmed, I just kept repeating on, and sort of telling myself, don't get overwhelmed, because when you get overwhelmed, you make bad decisions. Um, so I always just told myself, you know, one class at a time, one assignment at a time, you know, one course at a time. But what I did also try to actively do was to actually form, you know, a few friendships as well, a few good friendships um, during my postgraduate studies. And that helped me navigate everything quite a lot, to be fairly honest, because then there were a support system and a support mechanism. And I think I'm lucky um, with my formal training to come from a department where it was a lot like a family. And I don't think a lot of academics can say that, but I was very lucky in that our department focuses a lot on creating a very sort of friendly, very inclusive atmosphere. Um, I mean, to the point where, you know, our offices, you know, where the students sit are right next to where the professors sit. So there's absolutely no demarcation of, you know, status or anything like that. We all, you know, had tea together, lunch together. Um, and they very much did a lot of work in trying to foster a bit of a community spirit. So we did a lot of, you know, field trips and things like that, whether big or small, um, just to, you know, just improve camaraderie, like between staff and students. And I think that that actually did wonders for, for a lot of us because we then did start to form real friendships. And I think friendships and just having you know, just one person that you can, you know, confide in when you're having a bad day, that was, I think, the biggest the biggest form of relief um, at that point in time. <laughs> yeah, so I've been working for a long time. Like I said earlier on, like I was willing to take anything. Um, I'm still like that. Um, whatever opportunity presented itself, I kind of went for and I see where it's just kind of saw where it went. Um, so I got my first job at about 18 or 19 working in retail. Um, I worked at a clothing store and I did, you know, clothing sales and I did jewelry and cell phone sales and contracts and things like that. So, so really much a retail based um, position. But then moving on from that, I worked there for quite, quite a couple of years during my undergrad. Um, once I hit postgrad, I was given a few opportunities within the department to either obviously tutor some courses or act as a TA um, or act as a lab demonstrator. <clears throat> and I took all of those opportunities. So I did a lot of those jobs in parallel. And that kind of grew, you know, organically to other positions within the department at the time. So I was a course coordinator um, for a year or two. Um, and then I was a lecturer for a year as well. I lectured, you know, undergrad biology. And I did all of that um, before I had even finished my master's. Um, and then during my final year of my master's, something possessed me and I took an internship and I <laughs> did an internship for about a year and a couple of months. Um, with the National Research Foundation here in South Africa and I was based um, at Iziko Museums, which is the Iz Iziko South African Museums, um, which is also here in Cape Town. And I, I was in a dungeon all day doing like hardcore taxonomy. Um, so I was just working in the collections and it was the best job to be fairly honest. Um, you felt like such a real little scientist, <laughs> you know, and I got to see so many awesome things. I was in a museum, so I got to, you know, interact, really interact with all of those crazy specimens that, you know, the public does not see. Um, and so that was very exciting for me. After that, <laughs> I worked as an administrator, a departmental administrator for physics group, um, the Inter-University um, Institute for, uh, for Data Intensive Astronomy, sorry, IDEA. Um, that was based, it was a dual sort of position between the University of Cape Town and the University of the Western Cape. And I also did that for about a year. So I was working with a whole bunch of astrophysicists, um, just working in admin development, outreach. And so I was the PA to um, one of the directors for developmental outreach. And so I just kind of helped her with all of our sort of outreach activities and stuff like that and did some budget management. And then after that, <laughs> I joined HDA Pioneer. Um, we have now been for the last four, four or five years, um, and I joined them as a as a bioinformatics training coordinator. So absolutely an uncoordinated career in life, if I can say that. I think mentorship has been very much downplayed um, throughout academia. The importance of it has been very much downplayed. Although we all understand the importance of mentorship, we all have 
a mentor in some type of way, a professor or a supervisor who, you know, does some type of mentorship with us. Um, but I don't think it's very formalized in the undergraduate system, especially. And I think there's room for that. Um, now, I know it's, it's, it's not going to be organic if you say, you know, you must mentor this person. But I do think the structures can be put in place where people can say, hey, you know, I am interested in mentoring. I'm only a third year student, but I'm willing to mentor, you know, first year and be their buddy on campus. I think there's lots of room for that. And I think there might be sort of micro programs that exist within universities. So at, at my university where I study, um, at the University of the Western Cape, for example, they've got this buddy program, which is a, a, a mentorship program, but it's specifically for math where a third year or an honor student would mentor a first year student and they would have structured meetups. Um, the student can go to them at any point in time and say like, I'm struggling with this equation. You know, I just, I need a bit of help and they can arrange a meetup. And I always thought that was quite nice. And I always wondered why that didn't extend across the board. Um, because I feel like a lot of people would sign up and say, yes, I'm willing to be a mentor. And a lot of first years would say, I need a mentor. Um, and so I feel like there's no, there's not any strong mechanism like that across any institution I've ever been at. Although there are some programs, you know, some small programs here or there, or, you know, one department does it or one faculty does it, but I don't think it's unanimous and it's not something that's really focused on. Um, at least, at least not in my experience, in the places that, that, that I've been in, it's not focused on, but I think there is a lot of room to improve that because I do know that when you do have a mentor, we tend to go a lot further, a lot faster. Not just um, because they might be giving you help or guidance, but just to have that person to springboard ideas off of, who possibly has been where you are. Um, that is very important and it's invaluable. Um, just having somebody to say, you know, but I've been in that situation and this is how I navigated it. This is how I got through it, you know, or I haven't been in that situation, but I've been in a similar situation and this is how I navigated it. It just makes you feel like all's not lost. And sometimes it can be, you know, the sort of, you know, cooks between, you know, I'm going to stay in this line of work or I'm going to leave or I'm going to stay and continue my studies. I'm going to drop out. Um, so I do definitely think that a lot more emphasis needs to be put on that. Yeah, I mean, for me, and I think for maybe a lot of other women, I don't want to speak for other women, of course, I'll, I'll speak for myself, but for me, um, I think a very sort of complex issue does still exist in academia and that is just that traditionally all of the jobs were male dominated and so many females within a space is, you know, the only female there or one of maybe two females or three females, but you're usually in the minority. Um, and I think that has always been difficult because it's not that you feel like you're in the minority a lot of the time, it's that others make you feel that way. Um, you feel like you're a woman in science and I think we need to stop feeling like we are women in science and we just need to feel like scientists. Um, and so I feel like one day when we don't have to do all these women in science movements anymore, that's when science has really transformed, right? When I'm just a scientist and I'm not a woman in science. Um, but it's still been very difficult and I think that we have come a long way. I, I can say from my personal experience, uh, my experiences with, with men within the office has improved a lot over the years. Um, but I am still saddened by the fact that there are still a lot of experiences that I do have where I walked into the room and I was the only female there, or one of the only females there, or I was young, or I looked young, um, and so I was just not respected. Um, you know, I remember comments from people saying, oh, the science is cute. <laughs> it's not cute, it's serious, it's science. Um, and, and you know, you take those things with you and you kind of internalize it. And I think for a long time, I didn't want to communicate my science. When I did, I got a lot of stage fright. Um, I still feel like that. I, whenever I communicate my science, I always feel like there's going to be somebody who's going to do better than me. Um, and I think that's just how women are kind of made to feel inherently in science. Um, but I, I, I do want to say it has improved a lot. I, I experience that less and less but unfortunately still experience it. I still experience situations where I'm, you know, inadvertently told you're a woman, you don't belong here, or you're not going to be as good as the male counterpart. You're not as strong, or you're not as smart, you're not as witty. Um, and that happens way more often than I'd like to say, but it does happen. Um, but I think that to be fair, it happens to a lot of people. Um, and so I've also just been trying to just remember that 
you know, whenever something is different within an environment, it's going to be shunned until it becomes the norm. Um, and it's only going to become the norm when more, more women go there and more women will only enter those careers if other women showcase them and show other women that, you know, we do belong here and we do well, actually. <laughs> we're not just part of the crew, we're leading the crew. Um, and so I think that lots of women need to stop being scared of positions of power because they're scared of how it's going to, you know, transcend onto everybody else. Um, or how other people are going to receive it. I think they just need to own their space, own their right to be there and be there, you know, take up space and let other women see you, let girls see you, let them see that, you know, these careers are not impossible and it's not just for men, it's for everyone. And I also want that to happen in a very organic way again. I don't want it to be forced, right? I want people to want that. Um, but I think you get people to want that when you as a female are also just excellent within the spaces that you're in, you know? I mean, I very much feel like the way, the reason why I'm the way that I am is because I was raised in an environment like that. Um, even though it wasn't always accepted when we, when I was growing up and I was really little, um, you know, just still, you know, boys things were boys things and girls things were girls things and you didn't confuse the two. Um, but my parents, were really amazing in the sense that you know if I was interested in something I could do it if I wanted to try something I could do it if I wanted to go play with the boys and kick ball play in the sand I could do it there's no problem right because I'm just a person just like they're just a person and without realizing what they showed me was that I was equal um, and I think a lot of women don't get that experience growing up and so they have to find the equality within themselves or within other people sometimes which isn't which is unfortunate but that sometimes, you know, what 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 can happen. Um, but I think for me, I was always just lucky to have parents that really just told me you can do anything. And if the world tells you no, <laughs> do it anyway. Um, <laughs> it was maybe not the best lesson to teach a child because I became very stubborn and hard-headed. Um, but maybe that's also why I ended up succeeding, right? Because as, as much as the world told me no, I went, well, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> A lot of my life has actually been framed around education, either consciously or unconsciously. And so when I think about what I would tell my, my younger self, um, essentially, I would just tell myself to relax. You know, not everything is the end of the world. Failure is good. Failure is not bad. Failure teaches you what you don't know or don't know enough of, rather than telling you that you cannot do it. So fail forward, um, never fail backward. And another thing I would tell myself is that learning is personal. And so when you're trying to learn from people who have standardized that you might not do as well when you're within those boxes, but once you, you know, blur the lines a little bit and you start to do your own thing, you might actually realize that you're a lot more intelligent than the system made you think. Um, and I think that's very important for a lot of, of young girls and just anyone um, to remember that's coming from a difficult time in education and, and in academia is that we, we were, we're walking on standardized grounds as unstandardized people. Um, and so as long as the grounds are standardized, we might not excel as much, but as soon as we start to personalize those grounds, you know, you see people like me come out of the woodworks who maybe wasn't, you know, so much of a failure as a scientist. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, um, pie in the sky for me is to, to actually do research my way. Um, so, in essence, I would like to maybe one day obtain my own research funding, maybe soon, even, you never know. Um, I would like to sort of start my own group where we can do, you know, cross-relational research. Um, because I think, you know, interdisciplinary research is where the future is. And so if I could start a group that, you know, encompasses what I do, which is a lot of marine biology, taxonomy, genetics, and, you know, merge that with a bit of bioinformatics and also biodiversity informatics, which is a, a really up and coming field now, all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but the people are talking about it a lot more now um, that I think informatics has, has sort of taken a spotlight across the world. Um, so if I could, you know, form a group that just does, you know, draw from all of those experiences and come together, um, I think that would be really fantastic because I can only imagine the kind of research that we'd be able to do, you know, and the type of insights that we get. Uh, when we all come together and i think ha Bionet and a few others you know with the current dsi funding that they they've just received is they, they'll be doing that in in a sense actually they'll be kicking off that whole process so i mean if i can slot into that process somehow 
um, you know, and be, you know, key driver of that and a champion of that, then, then that's definitely what I would want. But more than anything, I'd also like to do some outreach. Um, so, so some science communication, because I also think that is lacking for a lot of scientists. You know, the communication and the outreach part of things is very much lacking. And so if I could start a group that actually, you know, there's some funding dedicated to outreach and there's some funding dedicated to science communication and everything we do is going to have a communication and an outreach component. I also think the impact that we'd have, the direct impact, you know, is going to be a lot higher than I think everyone that's working in silos and, you know, you, you're just kind of posting on Twitter or Facebook or something just because you have to, you know, or you just want to, you know, drum up some presence. But if you can actually put funds into strategizing your psychom, I also think you you do a lot better with your research overall. Yeah, so th there's not much that I that I'd like to add. Maybe the the only final thing that I would like to say is that if you believe that you should do, do something, you should do it. You shouldn't allow anybody to make you feel like you shouldn't. You shouldn't allow the education system to make you feel like you can't. Uh, because it very much often does do that. So I think if you have a vision in your mind and you believe that you are meant to do something, want to do something, do it. Find ways to do it in your own way. Because, you know, the rigid structured way is not the only way to do anything. You know, going to university is not the only way to learn. <laughs> there are many ways to learn and there are many ways for you to gain the knowledge that you need to do what you want to do. So my biggest lesson is find a way to do it. You want to do something, put in the work, put in the hours, put in the effort, put in the research time. So if you have the money, put in the money, but do what you have to do to do what you want to do and what you believe you want to do. And don't allow anyone externally to discourage that um, because it's very easy to do that for the right and the wrong reasons.